We are so incredibly honored to have Pastor Greg uh, with us. I feel like every time you're here, I, I, I say the same thing, but it, but it means so much. Uh, at dinner last night, um, now that I'm a new grandparent, you know, I was like, what title do you like better? Do you like, do you like uh, father or, or grandpa or whatever? And I was like, I know what I like better. And, and we both were like, we like father. Something about being a, a dad. I love being a grandpa. I love being pops and all of that. But man, I love being a dad. And, and Pastor Greg is a, in the truest sense of the word, he's a father to this house. I was sharing last night, this July will have been 25 years that we've known each other, and, and I'm not even going to get into stories, just been in awe for a long time, I'll say that, but Pastor Greg is one of the first people to father me, and, and I just... He, he's, he's taken on that role here. Almost every major thing we've ever had, Pastor Greg has been right there in the midst of it. And the Bible says you have many teachers, and we don't let just anybody teach from this pulpit, but you don't have many fathers. And I can count on less than half of one hand the fathers of this house. And Pastor Greg really being the chief. And so would you welcome and would you honor a father to this house, Pastor Greg DeVries, this morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for your warm welcome. Well, I can't say warm. Uh, came in Thursday for the wedding and got iced massively. But uh, thank you for your warm hearts and your warm welcome uh, this morning. It's, it's an honor. I don't know if there's as much of a higher honor that you can receive to be recognized in such. And that's always been a burning desire, ongoing desire in my life is to be a good father, is to be a great father. I tell our children and I tell our church that there's the difference between a good Christian and a great Christian is a good Christian does what they're told to do. A great Christian does it without having to be told. And uh, if I want to raise... Great children, the same thing. A good child will do what they're told to do. Uh, take the garbage out. Okay, I'll take the garbage out. But they should do it without having to be told, right? That's what we want to grow to. And so it's an honor to be, <laughs> it's an honor, uh, to be here uh, right now and to uh, stand in this role. It's interesting, the time that I come is that uh, uh, yesterday morning at 4 a.m., my spiritual father passed away. And I have, like Doug, I don't have many. I have uh, two of them. One is still here with us. But my first spiritual father, uh, Brother Jim Summers, he was a director of Outreach Ministries of Alabama. Matter of fact, 34 years ago, come this May, he made a home for me. He made a place for me in his ministry. It's a 13-month Christian discipleship program for people that are addicted to drugs and alcohol and life-controlling substances and uh, issues in their life. And, and if I would not have been able to go there, if they didn't open the house, I called three other places. Everybody was booked. I mean, there's drug problems out there, friends. There's, there's places people are looking to send uh, people that they cannot control. And uh, he asked me, he said, well, if you're really serious, he said, I want you to know this is not the Taj Mahal. He said, call me back tomorrow if you're really serious. And, and I did. I called back and they accepted me. And the first thing he ever said to me when I met him in person was simply this, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Now, I have to realize the last 34 years of my life, I'm just doing a little paint, a little tribute to this great man of God who lived and passed at 84 years old, had the ministry for there for 50 years. His son-in-law and daughter now run the ministry. I now sit on the board of directors uh, for this rehabilitation ministry and uh, that I now have a wife. Gretchen and I would not know each other. We have 12 children, six of them married. Two of my daughters here that are not married uh, yet, Hannah and Harvest, are here. And there's five, four more, I think, at home that uh, are not with us this morning. Uh, but none of those would be who they are. We would not have known each other. There's just no way. If he would not have made that home for me, there's no telling. There literally is not outside. I understand Jesus' work, but God uses people. He anoints people. He appoints people. And people do the service of God. 
And many people say no. Many people do not respond to nor understand that calling. But then to think of the countless people, the church that we pastor, the churches that we've planted, and the pastors that we have sent out, and the ministers, and all the different people. I would not know Pastors Doug and Annette right now. I would not know uh, uh, Pastors Abe and Allie right now. I would not know uh, any of you right now if it were not for that man. Because it was there that not only I got saved on a Tuesday night, I got called to the ministry. And not even that, if you've ever heard of the Brownsville Revival. Anybody ever heard of the Brownsville Revival? Steve Hill, same spiritual father. It was Jim Summers that got Steve out of jail. 450,000 people got saved in five years. That's just those five years. Steve was preaching a revival in Argentina. And Jim went down to visit, and Jim was getting ready to come back home, and he stood on the 13th floor. This is before Brownsville. He looked out the window and said, God, look what Steve's doing. What about me? He said, Jim, what if there's another Steve coming in the program? He said, that's fine with me. He flew home Sunday night, Monday morning, walked up to the windows, no air conditioning, in this little farmhouse, looked in the window and said, Jesus loves you. And the Lord said, that's him right there. There's another one. I was getting searched for any drugs or paraphernalia on my body or in my belongings there. I'm so thankful for a father. So thankful. Grandfather, great-grandfather, who knows how many people's lives, the ripple effect of that one person. Amen. Father, I thank you for Brother Jim Summers. I thank you for the men and women of God in our lives that have gone before us, that paved or trailblazed a path, who just spoke a word, something as simple as Jesus loves you. Lord, I speak blessings over all those, whether they were grandparents, whether they were neighbors or pastors, Sunday school teachers, whoever they may have been. Father, we thank you for those who have gone before us. We thank you most of all for the first fruit, your son, Jesus Christ. And I ask Jesus that as I preach, teach, minister the word today, that you would speak, that you would make yourself known. And I come in agreement, you are all around. You're all around. And Lord, you're in us. You're over it all. And we just submit to your divine will. Lord, I bless these people that made a great decision today to go to church. And even a greater one than that to come here. Lord, somehow, some way, by your spirit, You've drawn, they've followed. I ask now that they would be able to receive. So he that has ear, let him hear what the Spirit is about to say to the church. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, we're still in January, so it's early part of the year, and I want to share just a few things with you uh, that the Lord has kind of put on my heart uh, going into this year, and it's very simple. Uh, There's a lot that can be broken down in the midst of it, but simply this, I believe that 2022 is going to be a year of two things, preparation or elimination. I honestly believe this. I honestly believe that we're moving into a season that those who are the bride of Christ and those who want to meet Jesus and live with Jesus and spend eternity with Jesus are going to be doing everything they can to prepare themselves. Not just to meet him, but to be used of him. You don't want to meet him empty-handed, you know what I'm saying? You don't want to get there and say, well, I had life. And he say, did you have abundant life? I mean, that you make all preparations that you can. I believe that with that, there's going to be a serious sense of elimination in the body of Christ. There's going to be an elimination of those who really do not fear God, those who really do not seek God, because if you don't fear God, you don't obey God, you don't honor God. If you don't seek God, you'll never be able to follow God. It's not going to be the days of just attending church. It's going to be a people who are seeking and following God. There will be, according to the scripture, there will be an accelerated, advancing move of not just apostolic church, but of apostasy. There's going to be a distinct difference between those who fear God and those who do not. Therefore, my life and your life, to skinny this down, there ought to be a distinct difference between whether I love God or love the world. 
There ought to be a distinct difference whether I'm following God or swayed by the world. So you can look at the big scene and get lost in it or take care of the small core and take care of what's responsible, responsibility of your own. So with those who make preparation, they will use the process of elimination. Is there possibly anything in your life that needs to be eliminated? Is there a mindset? Is there a craving, a desire, a passion, a lust? Is there a disobedience? Is there an aspect of selfishness that needs to be eliminated? Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, he must deny himself. Pick up his cross. Is there anything you might need to die to? Anything you might need to surrender to and follow me? In these days, they're overcome by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony. Listen to me, if the blood's not being applied, without the application of the blood, there will be no elimination of your sin. You must prepare yourself for the blood. Gretchen and I are remodeling a bedroom right now. And we're looking at it as, I think it needs the third coat. That could be the painter's problem. But nevertheless... I don't want to put things back in if it's not finished right. You need to apply the blood of Jesus to eliminate any sinfulness in your life. So there's preparation that will ensue elimination. Is there anything in your life, is there anything in the life of the church that needs to be eliminated? The bride makes herself Amen. So I just want to encourage you with that. I also believe that the Lord has spoken to me into this season, into this uh, new era that we're going into, uh, that uh, even even moving into an era, the best way to move into a new era is to come out of old eras. You know? It's a good time to make a shift and a change. Uh, But as we move into the season, I believe the Lord has laid upon my heart that this is going to be a season of doors opening and doors shutting. The doors, now listen, there are doors, it says, that only God can open, and there are doors only God can shut. That's kind of like the angel of Michael, Gabriel, and him saying to, the, to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. I can't even deal with this door. Listen to me. Could that be the possibility in your life of the aspect of freedom? You came in captive, and you left free. That literally there may be a door that you have tried and tried and tried to shut, and you have not yet been able to shut it. This could be the season that he shuts the door you haven't been able to shut. Could there be a door? Now listen to me. If you haven't asked yet, don't expect it to open. And just because it hasn't opened after you ask, have you knocked yet? Have you sought yet? You get what I'm saying? Ask, knock, seek, right? If you haven't done all three of those, there are doors that not only, that only man can, excuse me, only God can open, but there are doors man can open too. Just because there's doors no man can shut and no man can open doesn't mean there aren't doors that man can shut and man can open. So you and I, again, need to open a few doors, maybe some areas to our heart, shut a few doors, maybe some areas to our flesh. But God's going to open and shut things that we have not been able to. But for those who are trying, those who are making every effort, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, Your number one desire in this season of your life ought to be relationship with Holy Spirit. Because if you are not led by the Spirit, you will continue to fulfill the lust of your flesh. For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. What might that imply of those who are not Spirit-led? Is there the possibility that the path is getting narrower and not broader? If your Christianity is broadening in horizons, careful where you step, careful where you go. Straight and narrow is the path that leads to Christ and eternity, the gates of heaven. Amen? So perspective. Last I checked, where doors are, things get narrower. Amen? So be looking for the door, not just the wall. 
looking for the pathway. There's doors throughout the scripture, but I'll just share this last one with you. Jesus is a door. Jesus is a door, such a door that he could even walk through when there was doubt in Thomas. He could walk through the wall. He he didn't need a door because he is a door. He's the door of doors. Add that to one of your songs. He's the king of kings, the lord of lords. He's the door of doors. It's exactly who he is. He's the shepherd of shepherds. He's the apostle of apostles. He just is. Amen. So as we go into this era and this season here, knowing he's the door, Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I stand where at the door. What door? The door of our hearts. He said, If anyone will hear my voice, position yourself to hear him. How do you do that? Eliminate all other sounds. Preparation and elimination. He said, if he opens up, I will come in and fellowship with him. Come in and fellowship with him. Immediately following, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, he said, I looked up and there was a door standing. Now here's the door standing at the door of our heart. Now he looks up and sees a door standing, not hanging, not hinged, standing. And it was an open door in heaven. If you and I will open doors here in our heart, he'll open doors you and I can't open. Are you with me? It's an interchangeable. He says, he said, here and there, you can have open heavens. Amen? So that's January 2022. Turn with me, if you would, into the book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 24. Chapter 24. As you're getting there, you can say this with me. If you get there, put your finger in. You can hold your Bible up, your tablet, your phone, or whatever it may be. But I want you to say this with me. I want you to make this decree. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can be who it says I can be. It was written for me, for my correction, for my direction, and my soon coming resurrection. Oh, Lord. Be it unto me, according to your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, what's so important about that? It takes humility. Isn't it amazing when people ask you to repeat something, how pride rises up, and you're like, I don't really have to do that. You know, reluctance, resistance. But the end of it is the most important thing. Anybody ever heard of that girl called Mary? She's betrothed to a boy called Joe. She conceived by the Holy Spirit. What did she say? I don't have to say that. She said, oh, Lord, be it unto me according to your word. Do you realize the word of God is a seed? According to Jesus, the word of God is a seed. I'm sowing the word of God this morning. I'm sowing the word of God, the seed. If I were to have an apple seed, and you took that little apple seed, very familiar uh, apple seed. They were all aware of that little brown apple seed. And you hold it in your hand. Do you realize that in that seed, there's roots, there's sap, there's fibers, there's bark, there's a trunk, there's branches, there's twigs, there's leaves, there's fragrance, And then there's apples, and then there's nutrients. I mean, all the stuff that's in an apple, and then there's more seeds. All that is in there. You need to realize, when I preach the word of God to you, there's healings, there's deliverances, uh, there's salvation, there's hope, there's love, there's courage, there's the... I couldn't even list it all. It's how you and I handle the word of God that determines what we'll receive from the word. Amen? So get ready. I'm going to sow a few seeds this morning. But listen, you may hear it at face value. That's just a seed. You, it's your responsibility to get it in the heart. And the heart determines whether you get a 30, 60, or 100-fold or nothing. Every seed has the potential of 100-fold. It's the soil where it's planted that determines the productivity, the effectiveness, the longevity, the fruitfulness, the sweetness 
of which it comes from. You know as well as I know. There are crops that you don't plant in Texas. And there's things that are planted here you don't plant in Maryland or upper state New York. It's all about the soil. Is your heart ready for the word of God? Amen. Be it unto me, O Lord, according to your word. We're going to take a little journey. We're going to take a little walk. I would entitle this message, Walking and Talking. How many of y'all know how to walk? thought you did. Anybody here know how to talk? Anybody here know how to talk a little bit more? You know, okay, anyway. So it, it, pick it up in verse 13. We're going to take this little journey. I wish that we could go through the whole story here. Now behold, we got a little saying back home. What you behold is what you become. He says, now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. A lot of, a lot of description there. There's a lot of information in there. It's not just an, an entry to go into to get a picture and get a scene there. There's something happening in the story. You need to know where they're coming from. Jesus has just been discovered that Jesus is not in the tomb. Somebody is over that rock and saying, what happened when God said move? Jesus is not there. People have discovered this. Women went early in the morning. Some mentioned here. Some mentioned there. They went in. They found out he wasn't there. They ran and told the apostles, and the apostles did not believe them. I can see a wife hitting a husband right now. See? It's been going on for years. And they discovered, but, but Peter decided, he said, you know what? Just me, because he had enough of these encounters that he was wrong in his initial response. But then it turned out to be true. It turned out to be real. And somewhere inside, Peter said, you know what? I think I better go check for myself. And he ran there and looked in, and sure enough, he wasn't there. Everyone they went back to tell did not believe him. Here's two guys walking away from that morning, and we're going to get in their little conversation. Listen to this. They're on their way to Emmaus. This is very important. Emmaus means warm springs. Now, I'm going to make a connection with you now so you'll know where we are later because it'll be very easy to forget where they were going. Warm springs. Jesus said, I don't want you to be lukewarm. I want you to either be hot or cold. I want you to start thinking right now, is 2020 going to be warm springs or is it going to be on fire for Jesus? Are you with me? Don't settle with lukewarm desire to be on fire for Jesus. And so they were walking seven miles from Jerusalem. That's a long walk, friends. That's a pretty good little journey to take, seven miles by foot. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. They're talking about everything that had happened. They're talking about, they didn't have a whole lot of knowledge of the cross because nobody was there. They all left. Nobody hung around the cross they all fled from him. They all denied him. I mean, every single one of them denied him and forsook him at that moment. But they're talking about everything that had happened. Uh, maybe, maybe the uh, Via Della Rosa, you know, just the walking or the carrying the cross. Maybe they're, they're discussing things. They're discussing uh, having to wait and discussing uh, that people are saying he's not there and coming back in this unbelief. They're, they're having a conversation, but it is about Christ. In verse 15, so it was while they conversed. And reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. My first point that I would like to make to you this morning is do you want to be closer to Jesus? Do you want Jesus to be close to you? Listen to me. They're, they're at a very extreme point in their life. He's missing. They have no concept of resurrection. They have no understanding. Nowhere in here does it describe that they realize he was resurrected. They have no sense of victory here. They have no sense of accomplishment or fulfillment here. So these guys are really in a very strained and a very difficult situation. And yet they're the furthest away because they think Jesus has been taken away. They're far away from Christ. And yet because of their conversation... Uh, because of the, of the area and the point of discussion they're making, the subject of their conversation, just talking 
to one another about Jesus, Jesus came nearer to them than they'd probably ever been before. We get one guy's name. We don't even have the other guy's name. They might have been just part of the crowd, but now he is with them and not with anybody else. He is near to them. Listen, the Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Now, when I say that, immediately you start to think, you start to think, oh, oh, that means I need to go to my prayer closet. That means I need to go deeper into worship. That means I need to turn on a praise song. It all has its place. We're not here to slam one thing, but I want to point out something else. Your conversation can draw you nearer to God. What are you talking about? If you're wondering why it feels like God's not there with you, start to realize what you've been talking about. If you're not talking about him, it's not going to feel like he's near and close to you. Your conversation can entreat him. Prayer is a conversation, and it entreats the presence of God. Praise is a conversation, and it entreats the presence of God. Your fellowship and your conversation with her, with him, with them, determines whether he's going to be close to you or not. Well, it might be a giggling matter right now. You said, oh, my goodness, you might embarrass somebody. You know what my geometry teacher? She had purple hair. How many of y'all remember ladies didn't know how to color the hair real well, and, and it looked purple? Thank God they changed that, and now they just go with straight purple. She would get upset with me when I giggle and talk with other people because she wanted them to learn geometry. And if it meant that much to her, why should I shy back on the gospel? Do you realize, like Jim Summers could change my life, we could change somebody's life negatively? They might miss the seed, might miss the word, might miss the moment, might miss the opportunity to go, amen. Yes, Lord, I receive that seed. This isn't child's play, friends. This isn't flannel graph Sunday school. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your conversations will invoke something and provoke someone. And if you invoke Jesus Christ with your conversation, you'll provoke the devil. And if you invoke the devil, you'll provoke God. Whose side? Our conversations. He, Jesus taught, be careful of idle words. Just talking about nothing. Nonsense. Matter of fact, I won't take the time to take you. You can go there if you're serious about it. To Malachi chapter 3. And those who feared God spoke often with one another. And there became a realization that the Lord recorded their conversation and remembered them. Do you have conversations in your marriage room? Do you have conversations in your business room? Do you have conversation in your car? Do you have conversations within your own mind that you don't want the Lord to remember? Elimination. Put the blood of Jesus on it. Repentance. Change the way you think. Change the way. Friends, this is not about growing bigger churches. This is about keeping the faith and moving forward and being prepared for when Jesus returns. Listen to me. If you have not thought about the return of Jesus in the last week, friends, you're, you're drifting. Throughout the scripture, all the epistles would direct you towards at one time or another and throughout the gospels to be expecting earnestly the return of Jesus Christ. That's not even on our scope. It's not even on our radar. Why? Because we're still more earthly minded than we are kingdom minded. Something's got to change. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The conversations that you and I are having, if they are not edifying, building up, drawing, and magnifying, and honoring, and recognizing the Lord Jesus Christ, something's not right. Amen? If what grieves God doesn't grieve you and I, something's wrong. There's a good possibility we might really be our own God. So they're talking, they're walking. They're having a conversation, and Jesus was drawn to that conversation. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. They didn't, they didn't know him this way. Uh, there, there was restrictions upon them. They, uh, they weren't into the, the, the realm to be able to see into the spirit realm of who he is. Verse 17, and he said to them, what kind of conversation is that that you have with one another that you walk and are sad? He's concerned not just about what you're talking about, but the condition of your soul in that conversation. Now, you may say, who are you to get up in my business? Start talking to him. 
Jesus said, what are you talking about? I'm asking you right now to consider the balances of your life. Give your life 100% in a 24-hour day. Say you're sleeping eight of those. Max yourself down there to eight to 16 hours and think about all of your conversations. And on a percentile, how much percent of your conversation and of your discussion, of your mind and the thought and the intellect behind that, is it really about Jesus? Now, you may say, well, I don't always talk about Jesus, but are you talking according to the way the Word of God says that you have holy conduct? You have righteous behavior. You follow what I'm saying? And listen, if there's going to be a great falling away, it might take a great pressing in to stay out of the falling. The Bible tells us in the last days there'll be many that will fall away from the truth, fall away from the grace, fall away from the faith. They will depart from it as if they make a decision to walk out a door of it. It says clearly in 2 Timothy that there will be perilous times and many there will be a great apostasy. Many will fall away and depart from the faith. Verse 18, he said, why are you guys sad? Then one whose name was Cleopas. Now, we got to stop there for a second and think maybe that's why he's sad. I mean, seriously, you know, I mean, you'd, you'd, I'd have a little issue. I'd be like, call me Cleo at least, you know. So Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which happened there in these days? Is there the possibility he just recognized something about his relationship? That Jesus is a stranger to him? He has no idea who he's talking to. I find myself in conversations with nobody present with inside of my head. And I thought, wait a minute, who did I just talk to? I think I'm having an argument with the Holy Spirit right now. I think I'm disagreeing with him right now. Or sometimes I'm like, oh my goodness, this must be the Lord. He just dropped something zany inside of me, and I believe he wants me to follow this out in faith. He said, are you the only stranger? Not every time do you nor I recognize Jesus. Matter of fact, I'm wide open to meeting Jesus in a way that I've never met him before. The disciples did all the time. He said he's walking by him on the water, and they thought it was a ghost. Shows that they didn't know a whole bunch about the Holy Spirit nor about Jesus. He's on the seashore one time, and they didn't recognize him there either. He's cooking fish, and finally Peter said, oh, my goodness, that voice, I know that voice. But I've never seen him this way. I don't know about you, but I want new revelation of Jesus. I want fresh encounters with Jesus. I want to know what I don't know yet and eliminate what I know that is a no to him. And Jesus said, what things? Now notice they're in a conversation. Now they have a three-corded conversation going on. Jesus is in there. Maybe your prayer life, as I said, getting closer is not always the aspect of having to go to your prayer closet. Maybe just your conversation could draw him in, get him closer. But is there the possibility that your conversation could be a prayer? That you're talking with one another because I want my conversation and your conversation together to draw his likeness. If I'm kind towards you, if I love you, if I'm considerate of you, if I prefer you, all that's going to draw Jesus closer. How many of you would like to have more of Jesus in your life? Be closer to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus to be closer to you. Have you ever gone to my, my father-in-law, owned a piece of property, and a, and a guy pulled up in a, in a Texas Cadillac. We live in Alabama. It's one of those big old Eldorados, and, and he got out, and he had his cowboy hat on his boots, and he walked around the land out there like a big shot, you know, and he's looking at the neighbor, the, the yard next to my father-in-law, and he's asked my father-in-law a question. He said, let me ask you a question. He said, were you thinking about buying the property? He said, yeah, let me ask you a question. He said, what? He said, what kind of neighbors will I have? I said, well, that all depends on what kind of neighbor you'll be. If you're neighborly, love your neighbors, you love yourself. That will draw Jesus. That will put the presence of Jesus in your life when you live and act and conduct in such a manner. He said, what things? They said to him, oh, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Did you notice that language? He was a prophet. They have no concept that he's living. He's past tense to them, yet he's present with them. You don't have to be perfect for Jesus to come and fellowship with you. But at least you're talking about the things of Jesus. 
Jesus will draw near to you. They said how the chief priests and our rulers and elders uh, delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. Listen to verse 21. This is key. But we were hoping that he was going to be in the office for four more years. Is that what it's? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There was a misread. A misread. Misread. I'm so sorry. So sorry. Can I say something about prophets for just a moment? I want you to understand prophets are meant to be regional, connected to the local church, and relational. They are meant to equip you. I think in our prophetic era, E-R-A, we've had a prophetic E-R-R-O-R. Too much predicting, not enough equipping. Prophets are meant to be a fivefold ministers who equip the saints for the work of ministry. Not some big wig that can hear better than you and tell you what's coming. And, and then if it doesn't, then they're not any good anymore. No, we ought to be prophetic inside of this house. Ought to be a prophetic house of prophetic people. Jesus could see and hear. That's all the prophet needs to do. And obey that and that only. Matter of fact, the number one step to being prophetic, what you need to know is what not to say. Honestly, I'm not saying out of fear. I've prophesied babies. I've prophesied finances. I've prophesied relationships. I've prophesied a lot of things. I'm not saying this out of fear. It's not a fear tactic. The reality is there are things that Jesus said that don't need to be prophesied. We are living in Matthew 24 days. Read them. Everything's falling out just the way he said. Everything was dissembled. The church was removed. Not one rock was standing. Not one stone. We're living stones. He's now rebuilding the temple. Famines, earthquakes, various places, pestilence, plagues, lawlessness. It's all happening. So to say that, well, he should be president, and they stole it from him, you think God was up there going, I didn't see that happening. No. He said there'll be lawlessness. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. But misrepresentation. God knew who was going to be in office. God knew. There's a way to say things, a way not to say things. This would be our desire to see this happen. Instead of just saying that's what's happening and now having to try to protect it and defend it. It's caused a lot of chaos and trouble in the church. Uncertainty. Listen, this is how I know there are prophets. He said in the last days there will be false prophets. You can't have false prophets if there's not true prophets. Amen? So, Jesus, here's him in verse 21. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since these things happened. What they're literally saying to him, he didn't do it our way. We wanted him to do it our way We're disappointed, we're discouraged, we're despondent because he did not do it our way. Friends, this is throughout scripture, it's throughout history, it's throughout generations, even to today. People get frustrated with God, walk away from him, leave him, try to go change and turn some roles because he did not do it the way they thought he was supposed to do it. I got news for you, he's God. His ways are higher than our ways. They're better than our ways. They're richer than our ways. His way is a way of holiness. Amen? So they were discouraged. They literally thought Jesus was going to come and establish a kingdom on earth to rule over Israel. and To be a king that would sit in that temple. He was letting the kingdom of heaven come to earth. Verse 22, yes, and certain women of our company, they were astonished us. They came and told us that his body wasn't there. They even saw angels, and they said he was alive. And verse 24, and certain of those who were went with us to the tomb found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. There's still this but. There's still this I don't fully believe what's going on. Notice who Jesus first appeared to when after his resurrection. His first appearance was to Mary Magdalene. If you know anything about Mary Magdalene, she had seven demons cast out of her. Why would Jesus go to her first? Well, she loved him most. That could be part of the part, part, but watch this. 
He knew that if that girl did not get filled up with the Holy Spirit, they're going to come back in seven times worse. Let me tell you something. Jesus cares about your condition. He cares about you. He could have just gone off to heaven, but he hung out here for another 40 days up to 50 days and just kind of stuck around with them and tried to minister and to get them back together. He cares about these guys. Even though their conversation is a little warped, at least they're talking about Jesus, and he cares. He wants them to get the story right. He cares. Amen? Verse 25. Then he said to these guys, Oh, foolish ones. That's pretty harsh, don't you think? Oh, foolish ones. Only a fool says in his heart that there is no God. Well, what were they saying? That we, we, you know, they didn't find him, so there's no proof there's a resurrection. What would proof of a resurrection be? Number one thing was he's not there. But that's not good enough for them. He said, you guys are acting like there is no God. You're working from here. You need to rethink this thing. You need revelation. Watch what happens here. He said, you're slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. You know, so often we're that way in church. When Pastor Doug gets up, someone gets up to minister, they're standing in in the role of a prophetic voice. And let me tell you something about the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Everywhere I've checked to see in the New Testament, they're all lowercase. They're not capitalized. It's not our identity. It's it's a responsibility to perform and to move in. He said, you guys are slow and hard to believe. You need to ask God to have a quicker belief system. There's not going to be 20 years to figure this stuff out. Amen? I shared the gospel with a guy at Round Top yesterday afternoon, yesterday morning. At the very end of it, he told me, he said, I'm not ready. I'm just not, I need more time. I said, look at me, buddy, and look me in the eye. You will never be ready to be saved. If you are and you think you are, you just became your own God. You just saved yourself and your own religion. You get saved, so when he comes back, you're ready. Mm -hmm. Salvation makes you ready for him. You don't get ready to get saved. There ought to have been a better amen for that. Anyway, oh, foolish one, still a hard belief. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter his glory? You know what he's saying? Didn't he tell you all these things? The prophets even told you it was going to happen this way. You can find it in the scripture. You should be able to know this stuff. Verse 27. This is beautiful. Okay, so we're getting closer. I'm going to wrap the next three up in just a few minutes. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures The things concerning himself. Golly. Stop. Stop. From Moses all the way through John the Baptist, Jesus expounded. Right about then, they're probably going instead of, could this be a 14-mile trip? Watch what happens. And they drew near to the village, Warm Springs, Where they were going, he indicated he would have gone farther. I want to expand your mind for a second. Do you want to get closer to Jesus? What I want to ask you now, do you want to go farther with Jesus? Watch this. He indicated he would have gone farther, Bianca. He had already explained to them about his life from Moses to John the Baptist. 4,000 some years. Of description. And now Jesus is saying, I'll go further if you want. They knew the past. He was getting ready to tell them the future. Oh, you got to get this. You got to get this. He was going to go further. He could have expounded. Watch, I'll give it to you this way. Possibly Cleopas could have gotten the book of Revelations. Jesus showed John 2,000 years in the future. He showed him the days we're living in. Showed him all things to come. He he said, I don't just want you to have a historical God. 
I want you to have a revelatory relationship with me. I want you to go farther with me. Jesus, when he was in the garden, it said he went a little farther. He fell on his face forward, not on his back to soak and to get lazy in Jesus and to get swelled up in Jesus. He pressed in and he pressed in. Paul pressed in. Jesus pressed And he prayed. Do you want to go farther? That's all I'm asking you. Do you want to get closer? Do you want to go farther with Jesus? So they drew near to the warm springs. He's like, I don't want you to stay warm. I want you to get hot. I want you to go further. Listen, you know as well as I know that you've got to turn the dial up on the stove or the oven to get the increased heat to go farther than just being warm. He said, do you want to go farther? Verse 29. But they constrained him and, and to him and abide he, and saying to him, abide with us. You need to understand something here. Turn with me to John 15. Keep your finger there. Turn with me to John 15. I think we have something backwards in our Christianity. It can work from both sides, but I think there's something we ought to be a little bit more mindful of. Pick it up in verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father's a vine dresser. Every branch in me does not bear fruit. He takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now listen to what Jesus said. Abide in me and I in you. I'll just stop there for time's sake. We, in our theology, has come into me and then I'll eventually come into you. And we spend the majority of our Christianity trying to make sure that Jesus is still inside of us and, and that we've got him in there and everything's right between us and Jesus. And we build theologies and philosophies and ideologies that try to build up some. Oh, you, you can literally talk about different denominations and give you their brand of how they see, whether it's Calvinism, whether it's once saved, always saved, whatever it may be. They've done everything. Jesus didn't say that. He said, you abide in me. I'll take care of me inside of you. He said when he comes back, we ought to be found in him. Did not say when he comes back, he ought to be able to find himself in us. He didn't come to seek and save himself. He wants us to be in him. And he said, only in him are we complete. So I ask you, is your Christianity pursuing completion? Are you in Christ? Listen, if you can walk in the Spirit, it has to indicate that somehow you can walk out of the Spirit. Amen? If you can live in the flesh, it somehow must make an implication, imply that we can walk out of the flesh. Amen? So he is saying to him, do you not just want to go get closer, go farther? Do you want to get deeper? I'm just giving you four little things for you to meditate on this week. Do you want to get closer to Jesus, your conversation? Do you want to go farther? Listen, they constrained him. It, 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 it seems to be a good thing. And that's what we do so often. Oh, God, we want your presence in church. We constrain you. Don't lead us out into the world, Jesus. We want you here. I know we don't say that, but we portray that. I'm here to tell you on good authority. That the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to come through evangelism. That's how the Spirit of God will be poured out on all, all flesh. When you and I let that river of living water, it's not just a little song, friends. When we let that river, those words of life come pouring out of us and we start to witness to our friends. We start to minister to other people. We start to reach other people. That's when that Spirit is going to be poured out on them. We think it's just going to be some crazy thing that happens up that yeah, this retractable ceiling is going to open up and the Spirit of God is going to fall. There are moments like that, but what happened in the upper room? When the unction came on them, the function began. They started speaking, and in the streets they heard him, and Peter preaches the first message, and about 3,000 souls get saved. And daily people will be added to the Lord. Where they started is where we need to pick up. If we're going to finish the way he wants it to finish. So do you want to get closer, nearer? Do you want to go farther? 
Do you abiding means to dwell? Do you want to get deeper? The first disciples, John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The next day he says, behold, the Lamb of God. In other words, guys, you got your life's right. Now don't take your eyes off them. Just start following them. There's life being forgiven of your sins. There's abundant life by following him. And those disciples in John chapter 1, they started getting close to Jesus. And Jesus turned around. And he looked at him. He said, what is it you're seeking? Let me ask you to ask yourself that question. What are you seeking? When you're in HEB, when you're at Walmart, when you're on Amazon, don't be afraid to ask yourself that question. What am I seeking? Don't be afraid to hear the words of Jesus. What are you seeking right now? What are you looking for? Because seek and you will find. And so he looked at them and said, what are you seeking? And they said, Rabbi, which meant they're teachable. Where do you live? Where do you dwell? Because, man, whatever comes out of wherever you're coming out of, and it happens out here, i got to find out what's in that place. You know what he said to them? Come and see. Have you ever found yourself in the Old Testament? Maybe you've been around it enough, and, you, and you're like, oh, that would be so cool to be like Solomon, and God say, you know, what do you want? We have the introduction to discipleship is that he says, what are you looking for? Come and see it. I'll show you that place. Do you want to go deeper with him? I'm rapping. But they constrained him. Abide with us. Stay right here. We just want a lukewarm relationship with you. The evening's here. The day's far spent. They're still thinking in the past. You know what the evening is in the Bible? It's the beginning of a new day. Did you know that? Read Genesis. And the evening was the beginning of the new day. They're on the horizon of a very new day. But they say, no, just stay here. We just want you here. We just want you here. Friends, we need to, we need to, to want to go farther with him. All right. He went and he stayed with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. I don't have time to go into all this, or maybe you don't have time. But here's the deal. We see this reoccurrence over and over in the Bible. What is he trying to do? He's trying to say, look, addition ain't going to get it. You can only have multiplication if there's two of them. If you just have one loaf, you just have one piece, nothing can multiply. He said, here, I want to break it and bless it. I want you to step into the double portion. I want you to step into the increase. I want you to know that I'll take care of everything pertaining to your life and everything pertaining to your godliness. I want you to have what I had and what has nourished me. I want to nourish you. I have been the bread of life. I want you to be the bread of life. What I have done, I want you to be done. Now listen to me. Jesus in John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, Jesus was exceedingly sorrowful. He was in great distress emotionally. And this is what it said. He said, I'm distressed. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. What should I say? There's a lesson. You know, it's kind of like mom saying, count to 10 before you talk. Right? I mean, I wish you would have counted to 10 about 10 times. And you wouldn't have said what you said. It got 10 times worse than what you felt. Even what, you get my picture. So Jesus is in stress, Pastor Doug. He's sorrowful. And even Jesus said, what should I say right now? Because his feelings were, I could say this right now, and this could ruin everything. I might feel good for a moment, but it could ruin everything. And this is what he came up with. Father, glorify your name. Father, feels like hell down here right now. Feels like I've lost everything. Everything's on the glorify your name. Could you imagine you and I in some of our most difficult hardships and afflictions and trials and tribulations if we decided, Father, glorify your name, instead of get me out of here. Where are you? You, whatever it could be. And it said the voice moved in like a cloud, a thundering voice. And the voice said this. (laughs) This blows me away. He said, I already have. But that's not all he said. He said, I already have, and I'll do it again. That's where I'm living. Do it again. The word testimony in Hebrew is defined do again. 
The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, which prophecy means something's going to be done. Testimony means something has been done. What is he trying to say there? Same thing he's saying to these guys, same thing he's doing. He's saying, look, what I've done, I want, I want to give it to you. I want to give it to you. Because uh, Jesus said, he turned around to his disciples. He looked at them. At this account, well, God just said, I already have, and I'll do it again. He said, he did not say this for my sake. He said it for yours. In other words, Jesus said, get it, guys. Get it right now, guys. You need to understand. Right now, we're in a transferring. We're in a transaction right now. Right now, we're in an impartation. What I've done, now you stop for a moment and think of what he did. And he also taught, he said, if anyone believes in me, he'll do the same works I did and greater works. I don't know. I hope I, hope, I had I an had absolute, the, the, the enemy put a demonic thing on me as a child. I had a fear of crippled people. Fear of wheelchairs. I mean, nightmares, dreams. Friends, I've seen the lame walk. I've seen the blind see. I'm telling you, God will do it again. I've seen the dead raised. I've, I've seen it. I've been there. But he's going to do it again. Anything he did, stop a funeral, raise the dead, clear the mind, set the captive free. Do, do you get this? He's for generations been going around. I, I thought about going to the grocery store today and just getting a bunch of bread, but I didn't know how much I, and just give everybody a roll. So you could hold it in your hands. He said, I'm going to do it again. Would you not be interested in healing somebody instead of making fun of them or being afraid of them, but bringing faith to them? That's the that's church he's looking for. Not a constraining church. He says, look, guys, I, I just came in because I want you to have this and to know who I am. I don't want you to live in doubt. I don't want you to live in unbelief. I don't want you to live in frustration. And listen what happens. He blows, he he broke it. He blessed it, broke it, gave it to them. Their eyes were open. They knew him and he vanished from their sight. I'm not sticking around here, guys. It's your turn. Here's the last one. Maybe a musician or two can come up. And they said to one another, remember, here's two guys on their journey to Warm Springs. Just satisfied with Jesus to be in their house. Just satisfied that everybody in their family had asked Jesus in their life. But have you fulfilled the call of Jesus? Are you living the purpose of Jesus? Are you bringing revelation to other people? Let me say this to you, just so you can have this in your hopper. Some of you are young, some of you are older. We're all in different ages there. But I don't think any one of us should get to heaven not having anybody on our account having been one to Jesus. I really don't. Why would I say that? Listen, if the God who so loved the world and is not willing that any souls would perish really lives inside of you, I think your heart would feel that way too. Think about it. That's pretty simple. Pretty simple. They said to one another, did not our heart burn within us? Closer, farther, deeper, hotter. Hotter. On fire for Jesus. Spending time with Jesus will set you on fire. How do I know that? He's the baptizer of the Holy Ghost in fire. And I'm telling you, wherever he's been, there will be evidence there's been a fire there. There's been something lit there. Their hearts were burning. A few years ago, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want, to, I want to welcome you into the fellowship of the burning hearts. Hearts on fire for Jesus. Lit for Jesus. A flame for Jesus because of Jesus. As he talked to us, he opened the scriptures to us. So they arose, listen, so they arose that hour and returned to Jerusalem. Okay. They got to be on fire. Matter of fact, when you burn fuel, you ignite. There's an ignition that ignites it, and it burns the fuel. These guys had gotten home seven-mile walk. Some of you couldn't walk seven blocks without griping and complaining, without calling Uber. They get so far, Jesus, 
what they've walked away from they're walking back to. They turned around in that moment on another seven mile walk back where they came from because they missed it before. He does, listen to me friends, he does not want you to miss this move of God. He does not want you to miss this era. He does not want you to miss this season. He does not want you. He is willing to set you on fire. He's willing to come closer. He's willing to go farther. He's willing to go deeper. And he's willing to make you hotter. And found the 11 of those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that happened on the road and how they'd known them in the breaking of bread. Notice, they're no longer talking about what happened, but what was happening in their life. Why don't you stand to your feet? I simply invite you for a moment of prayer for a moment of decision making, for a moment of request, if there's anything inside of you that wants to get closer, to go farther, to get deeper, and to become hotter, if that's really where you are, I invite you to come to the altar for just a moment. I invite you to come stand, come kneel.